Welcome back Nerdlings. Today we are having a look at some fantastic beasts and where to find them. But before we start, be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. You probably already sussed me with the title of the video. My bad, I couldn't help myself. It's just my wife loves Harry Potter and it's starting to rub off on me, I think. So, what are we looking at? This fine fella is a crazy custom jobby I did about two months ago. He's made from a Ralpatha throne of bone. Metal shields from the Pantheon of Chaos Kickstarter campaign, a set of plastic skulls which I used to build up the area behind the throne, and some plastic pieces from the Chaos War Shrine, namely the large metal skull backplate and the mutated ogre bearer. I also used a fair bit of milliput to blend the pieces together, sculpting a sumptuous quilt for them to lounge on, some rather interesting tentacles on the ogre, and of course, some curious textures on the underside of the throne where the ogre meets the metal palanquin. The base is lasered MDF and is 50mm squared to give you an idea of the size of the thing. Now I've had this guy on the paint table for what seems like an age. He's been in various stages of build for about two years now so I thought it prudent to fix him up and get him painted. He's the master of slaves and works for the Chaos Dwarfs. Yet I imagine he would work for just about anyone that would pay him enough. Under his watchful eye he marshals Chaos Warrior, Chaos Dwarf and Ogre slavers who cajole the unwashed masses into regiments to fight and die for his paymasters. Not only this, but he's a mighty warlord in his own right. Any man powerful enough to deal with the Chaos Dwarfs and not suffer from their duplicity would have to be. I would suspect his own slave army to number in the many thousands, made up from a plethora of races, colours and creeds. His most trusted servants may even partake in his enormous wealth, gaining treasures beyond their wildest dreams for fealty, and he gifts his strongest fighters with thick armour and durable weapons as reward for their efforts. Whether they fight to simply survive or to impress, he cares not. The next creature we have in the beastery is a Jabberslith, however I would rather call it a Jabberwocky as I loved the old Monty Python styled movie when I was younger. I know it doesn't have wings but I didn't like the awful fine cast things it came with so this chap is wingless. It's climbing over some tree bark and old rusty bits and bobs as I wanted to weigh it down a bit and make it some, somewhat more robust. The base is 100mm by 50mm lasered MDF and should be heavy duty enough to hold it and the metal pieces. As a somewhat unaffiliated monster, it roams around the edges of the battlefield scavenging for stray horses, weakened foes and friends alike, I, I doubt it cares much. It makes its home in the dark swamps and cave systems on the edges of the border of the Empire. Whilst physically strong and formidable, it is a carrion creature preferring to eat the flesh of the dead and dying rather than killing fresh prey. The stench of its hide can be smelt for miles around as it smells as bad as the filth it consumes. Trolls and other despicable swamp creatures are the only things that dare venture near. For those unwary travellers who stumble across the lair, they may be forgiven for assuming it is nothing more than an empty, dank cave. They are sorely wrong, however, as beady eyes watch them silently from the darkness. Interlopers are dealt with in the long night when they are scared and weak. Following the Jabberwocky is a Chaos Dwarf Bull Centaur, a mighty creature of myth. The powerful legs and bulk of a boar combined with the deadly cunning of a Chaos Dwarf. He's a metal model from the Pantheon of Chaos Kickstarter and comes in several pieces. The torso, main body, and then two right feet, as the casting would have been difficult with four feet attached. He's mounted on a regular cavalry base but is used as a single character rather than within a unit. The ball centers are formidable foes, often making up the vanguard of Chaos Dwarf armies when in number. You may notice some familiar features if you have collected Chaos Dwarfs in the past, or are familiar with some of the early war machines that were produced for them. The styling comes from one of the Chaos Dwarf centaurs, driving either the Chaos Dwarf Tenderizer or Whirlwind, and it's plainly obvious to see the pains taken to make a suitable homage to the original design. Here is my Beastmaster, and a mutated Hound of Chaos. He has long been one of my favourite models, 
and was one of the first miniatures I painted for the army way back in 2017 when I first started the Barocca series. He comes armed with a rather nice scythe and whip and drives his dogs to war. I have four painted up so far and a few more kicking about in various boxes. They are all different and have their own little personalities. My Beastmasters are a real blast from the past, some being Citadel Chaos Warriors and Chaos Dwarfs, whilst others are Ralpatha Ogres and Dark Elves. They whip, scream and use brute force to move huge monsters, packs of dogs and other nefarious critters towards their enemies. Few dare withstand the charge of a rabid pack of wolves. Next is a mighty Minotaur, another to add to the herd. He is an old miniature with a somewhat oversized head, but is all the more adorable for him. As you can see, he has some rather nice glowing red eyes and a huge club with which to smash his foes. Standing anywhere from 8 to 16 feet tall, a Minotaur is a brutal killing machine, easily capable of splitting a man in two, ripping a horse apart or otherwise causing the maximum amount of disruption to the enemy lines. It's no wonder they inspire fear in man, their blood-curdling howls and grunts carrying far across the battlefield. The Minotaurs are the fearsome guardians of the forests, and in particular, the herdstones of their kin, the Beastmen. Whilst often solitary beasts found in caves and labyrinths of the ancient world, they'll band together in large groups to defend their realms and flock to the banners of particularly powerful beast lords in search of blood and battle. The largest of their kind may even become a Minotaur Lord, a Beast Lord in their own right, commanding many dozens of Minotaurs and hundreds of lesser beastmen. Thankfully, these monsters are few and far between, preferring never-ending battle in the realms of chaos, rather than the hunting of lesser prey out in the old world large. The awe-inspiring Dragon Ogre is our next monster, a beast that time forgot only talked about in hush whispers over flagons of ale at the local tavern, for few have witnessed such a beast in person, and tales oft grow large when passed down the generations. Even though few genuinely believe the tall tales to be true, best not speak them too loudly, just in case. This chap is a first generation dragon ogre, made from lovely old lead and mounted on a plastic chariot sized base. He is clad in a mix of chainmail and plate armour and wields an axe large enough to cut a knight in twain. Best used as a shock and awe lone monster, is easily capable of holding a regiment at bay, weathering their puny attacks with armour and scale alike. The dragon ogres of old only rise during the cacophony of thunder and lightning storms, for not much else can raise them from their slumber in the mountains. It is said the largest of the race, Krakenrock the Black, is the size of a mountain and that is coming heralds the end times. Earthquakes and volcanoes shatter the mountainside as he wakes. All who look upon him are doomed. To finish off our stint on monsters, it will be prudent to look at some mutated beastmen. First off, we have the Ostrich Man, a curious fellow sometimes seen in the circuses of the old world or lurking in beastmen herds. Weak and ungainly, his only real contribution to the herd is his unquestionably long neck and good eyesight. Often employed as a lookout or simply as a wretched slave to the beast lord, he is still a creature of chaos and deserves not your pity, for he would have your head if you but turned your back on him. The second of our mutated friends comes in the form of a terrifying mud man. Swords and lances pierce his hide, causing him no mortal harm. A strange and rare mutation, he's unique even amongst the varied bodies of the beastmen. Slow and lumbering, as if underwater, his attacks are not particularly powerful. Over time, he has learnt that he is next to indestructible and can withstand horrendous bodily damage, always coming back for more. To that end, he makes an excellent guard. However, he is best used in ambush lurking in swamp-like surroundings where he can overwhelm lone enemies and quietly digest them over many days. Our third mutant is a lizard man from Lustria. Whilst maybe not technically a beast man, he is suitably different and quirky to join the herd. His scaly skin, light armour and shield make him a robust little unit 
capable of holding off most enemies whilst his herd joins the fray. Given a second chance of painting him, I'll give his shield some interesting designs, maybe painting a face on it or at least some checks around the edge. Like many of the creatures in our beastery, he lives in the swamp and his fighting style reflects this. Ambush from the water is his preferred method, especially unwitting foes who don't suspect there to be anything below the surface of the water but branches and weeds. The fourth beastman in our jaunt today is the sloth man, slow to anger, pondering yet powerful and not particularly smart. He is a stalwart of the beast lord, muscle and fur cover his body and long claws protrude from his hands and feet. Despite his natural weaponry, he still carries a weapon of his own, whether this is to signal that he is more than simply a beast or through mere imitation of his beastmen brothers is unknown. Finally, we have the glorious Zygor, a mysterious little creature. He's a classic chaos monster that was sold as a set with a two-headed ogre called Leaping Slon Two-Face and I believe a three-headed harpy, whose name I forget. He's a fantastic compact little chap and would make a decent leader for any group of mutated chaos goblins or some such critters. While small, I think he is pretty robust and can hold his own in a fight. Well, that just about does it for today's video. Which model did you like the most and why? Be sure to comment, like and subscribe. And thanks very much for watching. Peace.